DMT Infinity. He's gonna fucking train your brain. Shout out to DMT Infinity. This is a collaboration with DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity, you crazy motherfucker. This is our local astronaut. DMT Infinity is our local astronaut. You know, right now, NASA has a couple guys in space. And who cares what they're doing? Because DMT Infinity is the real astronaut. This boy is steady blasting off. If you know what I'm saying. DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity. DMT Infinity. 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 What is going on, everybody? And welcome to the newest installment here on DMT Infinity. This is episode two of my podcast, A Psychedelic Point of View. And today we have Chris on from Christopher's Organic Botanicals. Christopher, how are you doing this week, man? How has this week been treating you? Good, good. Can't complain. Still here, uh, still doing what I can to talk to people back home. So. What got you interested in Mitra? Was it specifically for medicinal purposes or recreational purposes or both? Um, definitely medicinal purposes. You told me that it, that it saved you from a life of pain, correct? Yes, correct. See, and I think that that is one thing that a lot of people don't realize about the substance is the fact that people can use it recreationally, but there are a lot of people who benefit from it medicinally and therapeutically. Oh, definitely correct. Um, have you ever, maybe not suffered from, but have you ever had extreme anxiety or depression in your life? Um, I would say anxiety, yes, my whole life. Um, and would you say that's... that Mitra aided you in overcoming that, or at least helping you, like, uh, in any way? I think a combination of, yeah, I think a combination of Mitra and um, a couple other herbal plants that I use uh, work wonders. On me. Really, I looked for pain and this was just a nice side effect that helped with that too i was like wow lessened your anxiety a little bit kind of made me feel like all right you know whatever's going to happen today i can do this and you know that was a nice added benefit so when so what year did you start christopher's organic the uh, technically it was 2016 but i found like about a year and a half a year before so whenever you started to take it, um, did you feel the, like, don't, like, don't get me wrong, I understand that from any businessman or businesswoman's perspective, it is always good to make money. But aside from just the factor of money, what made you want to sell this particular plan out to the world? Um, well, when I first started buying, I don't know if you remember our metro, uh, got to remember that when I first started using it. I went to eBay and I bought it in a Ziploc bag with the name of it written on a magic marker. So I was like, wow, this stuff really works and this is what we're doing. And I didn't know there were a couple other uh, GMP companies out there, but I didn't know about them. I found it. I went Google or Google Mick and looked up and I found YouTube videos, found eBay links, found all that. So I went to eBay, started looking around, found a couple good quality products. But after a while, I just was looking like, why am I looking around? There's got to be a better way of doing this. So I started reaching out to farmers in Indonesia, started really getting samples of the products, seeing if we got, you know, the best manufacturing, the best quality control. Um, longevity for the plant was very important to me, that they weren't cutting down the trees and stripping down the trees, that they were actually plucking the leaves from them naturally the way it's supposed to be. Uh, old growth. And I found the guy I was looking for about five years ago. and. Rest is history. I just wanted to make sure that this plant was properly tested, not sold in a Ziploc bag, properly packaged with warnings and labels, the way it was supposed to be done. And money was the was the after effect of it. So, and we're so, still small. We're, we're a mom and pop, basically, in the uh, world. We, we're still a small company. So out of the three uh, main veins, what would you say your favorite is and why? Um, I definitely like red. Uh, occasionally, I do like white as well. I'll mix uh, half red, half white together, um, probably for the relaxation and also for you know pain relief. Honestly, that's what they work great together. 
off of the top of your head, what would you say your top three favorite strains are? Um, the different types that I like would be Red Mang Dao, White Mahakam, and also probably like a Green Malay. Have you ever tried mixing any strains together? Oh, yes. Yeah, pretty much every right, day. Right now I have some White Manda, some Red Bentugane, um, uh, I think Green Manda. It's some kind of a green. And then I have another White up in here as well. We got a whole uh, uh, mixture. Yes, I've noticed that whenever I mix it, then not only do I get stronger effects, but I also tend to get more. You see, personally, I use it uh, recreationally, therapeutically, and quote unquote spiritually because I like to use it for meditation. I use it whenever I'm creating art, and it allows me to stay up at uh, longer periods of time. But at the exact same time, whenever I finally crash, I can finally have that 12 to 20 hour sleep. And whenever I do sleep, Mitra tends to give me very, very, very vivid dreams, and I love to dream, so it has helped me with lucid dreaming. So I've noticed that there have been several uh, benefits from it, not only just uh, for using it to conjure up more creative ideas, but to actually uh, be able to go deeper into my unconscious and bring that all into my conscious mind. And uh, basically, uh, just to use it uh, I mean, I don't, I don't like to use the word spiritual because everybody has a different interpretation of it. But, I, but I use it in order to access that, that part of myself to actually, uh, to actually expand my consciousness and to go into those deeper states of mind. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, Mitra is not a psychedelic, but it does have psychoactive compounds in its chemical makeup. And the more of it that you consume, the more of those properties are um, um, actually come out, especially if you are combining it with cannabis, I've noticed. And uh, it's, it, is, it is amazing what the plant can do. I've been using it for about four or five years now, almost every single day. I did take a one-year break from it, but... Yeah, good to take the break. Absolutely. And uh, I know that there are a lot of people who say, and and I know that this is a fact, that there are people who get withdrawals from it, but I've personally never experienced that myself. In fact, after using it for about three years of my life, every single day, 10 to 50 grams every single day, I quit cold turkey, no withdrawals, no negative side effects. I wasn't craving it, and I went that entire year without even, well, I was thinking about it in the same way that I would think about anything, but it wasn't like I felt some need to go back to it. It was just like me with uh, with cannabis. You know, I used cannabis when I was younger, and I didn't use it for a long time, and now I'm a medical cannabis patient. And even in between, I'll use cannabis instead of some or cannabis back and forth, and it's a great balance uh, for helping with pain and everything else. Uh, I was hit by a car at eight years old. I'm in my mid forties now, so. Um, I was on opiates at eight years old. It was for the pain I was in up until my late 20s. Uh, during, during that time, opiates weren't doing it. So 30 pills a day weren't the best for me, but they weren't doing it. They weren't solving the pain. So I drank a, probably about a fifth a day for a good period of time in my life, trying to kill the pain away and, you know, a functioning alcoholic, whatever you like to call it. And then I had a heart attack at 36, uh, kind of stopped it looking for something natural, didn't drink anymore. I stopped drinking in my late 20s, which was taking a lot of NSAIDs, which I could take from my heart after 30 seconds. So that's when I was looking for something natural, and I found it, and I was like, oh, great. Cannabis combined, it's just, I don't need anything else. Yeah, see, I was engaged for about five years of my life, and whenever my ex fiance left me for this dude that, well, I won't even uh, get into all of that uh, <laughs> since, uh, uh, since we're a public, but let's just say that it was very heartbreaking for me. It was, it, it drove me to being borderline suicidal, and I became a drug addict for a year of my life. I was drinking hard liquor every single day, bottles this big from the time that I woke up to the time that I passed out. And if it wasn't for Mitra, I would be dead right now. It literally saved my life, got me off of alcohol, made me stop using all of that dumb shit that I was taking. And ever since then, I couldn't be more grateful. I agree. I don't drink at all. I haven't touched alcohol in almost two decades. 
as far as you know, when did people start first using Nietzsche? Um, from what I can understand is back in Indonesia, they've been using it for thousands of years for medicinal. In the United States, um, from what I understand, and I've talked to a few different people from Indonesia and here, it looks like it came over a lot and started to get more known to people after the Vietnam War. But then it wasn't so much, the, you know, the vets and soldiers would bring it back. But then back in the 90s and 2000s is when it started with the internet and everybody seeing it online. And that's when it really got popular. Before the internet, nobody, it was word of mouth. You know, so how many different people are you going to bump into and talk about a, a, a tree that you had from Indonesia back in the 70s? And 60s? Yeah, see, the internet is quite fascinating um, in many senses, but especially in the sense of being able to give people knowledge that they would have never known about before. They can hear about other people's experiences, and then they can try it themselves, go to online uh, websites such as christophersorganicbotanicals.com to actually purchase these substances from a safe, trusted source, and they don't have to worry about these substances being uh, contaminated with other substances that may potentially end their lives because I've because I've tried to explain to people that people do not die as a direct cause of Mitra but people die whenever they are combining it with stupid substances and if you buy Mitra from gas stations or something you don't know what is inside of it so you could be getting something that has a research chemical inside of it correct and that's what happened I think it was Sweden in 2009 with and it had the, uh, what was it, tramadol mixed in with the, and they were selling it, and the people OD'd. There was 12 or 14 deaths, and they were saying that this is where it got its bad name. This is like the original, from what I understand, the original story that kind of the United States grabbed onto, and a bunch of people died. It wasn't from the, it was from the tramadol in the, and even if they were selling water with that much tramadol, then somebody would die. So what are you going to do? Ban the water? Like, it's just ridiculous, the whole thought process and why plants and I mean, the science is coming out now. I thank the AKA for what they do. Some people can hate yeah, the, I mean, the American Association. Yep. And some people can, you know, have their words about what they think and about the AKA or whatever. But I've seen some real, real results from them. And I really support them 100%. So what do you say to people who claim that Mitra can give people liver damage? Um. All right. Well, like I said, I'm a cardiac patient. I had a heart attack almost 10 years ago. I go for regular blood work, heavy metals, liver enzymes, everything. I've been using regularly for five years, over five years. Not once has my personal blood work ever came back with a problem. I know plenty of other people who have said the same thing. I also know people who have said they've had liver problems when they were using them heavily. But when they're saying heavily, some of these people are telling me they were using 50 grams a day, 80 grams a day. That's way too much. That's, uh, that's overkill. Less is more with I think that it could depend on the person's uh, uh, biological makeup as well. 100%. It's so individual to every single person. Um, it might work the same, similar, like similarly with me or you, but you're going to have, you're going to feel a little different if we both take white mang dot, three grams of white mang dot. And I say, oh yeah, give me some energy. You might be like, eh, I'm going to give me so much energy. You maybe feel a little bit, you know, some, everybody's body's different. Depends on what you eat that day, how much you eat. It, everything matters. So, yeah, I believe there are some people that it's not a good fit. Just like cannabis. Some people, cannabis yep. isn't a good fit. You know, yep. and other herbs, St. John's wort, uh, ashwagandha, there's a lot of interactions. You can't take St. John's wort, ashwagandha with other things. Same with cannabis and herbs. Yeah, and you see, the thing about cannabis is, and I, I hate it whenever you have stoners. And look, I love weed. I smoke as much as I can. But I hate it whenever stoners say, oh, man, everybody should should smoke weed, da, da, da. No, the, there are lazy stoners and there are productive stoners. Not everybody gets the same effects from cannabis. Like if you take Snoop Dogg, for example, the dude is one of the most productive and most successful people in the world. But I also know people personally who all they do is smoke cannabis, sit on the couch, eat junk food, and just watch TV. 
I mean, cannabis does not affect everybody differently. And usually a um, a stoner in, in uh, those positions saying that kind of stuff are like, oh, well, maybe they should try an indica instead of, I mean, a sativa in instead of an indica. No, because it doesn't affect everybody the same. Like just because you have a lot of energy because you're consuming a sativa doesn't mean that you're going to be productive. Correct. Some people are better off living a sober lifestyle, whereas you have other people who maybe take psychedelics once or twice a year. You have some people who smoke weed every single day. Not everybody's the same, and I think people need to start understanding that. And that is also the same problem with drugs in general. I hate whenever people put a blanket statement over drugs and say, oh, man, all drugs are the same. No. The reason why people say that all drugs are the same is because people don't have an intellectual vocabulary to actually talk about each individual substance and how they affect the mind, body, and consciousness, and the fact that every substance will affect everybody differently, even if it is slightly different. I would agree, 100%. Definitely. That's why, that's why there's not just one plan out there. There's many medicinal plans for different people for different reasons. That's why I agree with that. Everybody's got to find out what works for them. That's really what it is. Personally, I think that the only the the only drug or drugs that I would ever say maybe not everybody but most people could benefit from are plant-based traditional psychedelics, but they would have to have a full understanding of what these substances are and they would have to be using them responsibly. Um uh, respectfully and also in traditional manners. Like if you're just going to take mushrooms to just go to a party, don't do it. But if you're going to use, but if you're going to take like two or three grams of psilocybin mushrooms and then go see a therapist, well, yeah, I think that people can certainly benefit from that. Well, I agree. I mean, I have people that I know in my family. I know uh, somebody and he's trying almost everything. He's a Vietnam War and he's got Agent Orange poison. It's really bad. And they've tried everything, including the uh, ketamine therapy for him, and just nothing worked. That's one thing they haven't tried was the psilocybin mushrooms. And I read into the microdosing and everything like that. And I, I really think that could be beneficial, but that the VA and, you know, he's in his late 60s or 70s, and he's not really too much on, you know, he's tried the medical cannabis. It's not working. Um, he's tried the, it's not working. And I think there's, some, there's some people that got to be stuff out there that are beneficial. You know, help break through and get to the point where they need to, you know, everything's a tool. The plants are a tool. And you got to use the plants as a tool to get where you need to get. And, you know, some people are having it harder than others. Yeah, and there are a lot of uh, people in the psychedelic community that like to quote uh, a philosopher named Alan Watts. In this quote that he says, uh, when you get the message, hang up the phone. And don't get me wrong. I understand where he's coming from. But the thing about psychedelics, and first of all, Alan Watts was a major alcoholic. And it is kind of uh, counterintuitive for him to say something like that whenever he was drinking 24-7. Yeah, right. But the thing about, I think that that quote gives people the wrong idea about psychedelics. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't think that psychedelics are something that you should do every single day. And if you are someone who does it every single day, you better have the mindset of a shaman. But the thing about the psychedelic experiences, the psychedelic experience is, is the fact that there isn't a the message. There are an infinite amount of messages. But if you don't implement what you've already learned up to that point into your life, then the psychedelic will keep telling you the exact same thing. The psychedelic doesn't change your life. It just teaches you how you can change your life. But if you don't act on that, then the psychedelic can't do anything. But if you implement those lessons into your life and then you have the psychedelic experience again, you can go even further and further and further. Makes sense. Like the old phrase, leading a horse to water. Psychedelic leads you to the water. It's up to you to drink. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that is a fantastic way of uh, putting it. Do you, uh, ha have you ever gotten into meditation or lucid dreaming? Uh, meditation, yes, definitely. Not lucid dreaming, no. I've actually uh, tried a cup of that tea that I forget what it's called, that herb, the dream tea. I think I've heard of that, but I don't know um, if it works. I've never tried it myself. 
Let me tell I don't really. Occasionally, I remember dreams here and there, but not really too often. I can say, so that I can tell you. And if I do remember, it's briefly when I first wake up, but it's rare that I remember any of them. I have say. you ever, have you ever tried um, Mitra Extract? Uh, yes. Yep. I have tried it to see how it would work for me. Um, I've tried the shots. I've tried the tablets. I've tried a whole bunch of different ones. Um, there's only one that I've tried. It was like they actually made it. Um, it's a cream powder and a cream extract pressed into a tablet. You got to chew it. That's the one part. So you're going to taste it. You're not getting away without tasting it. But you chew it, and it really worked. And that's the only one that I've ever tried. It was from one of my buddy's companies, and, you know, it really worked well. So that was something he had sent me to try because I was in pain. So, but yeah, yeah. They, they work. But man, they a lot of them. My problem was they messed up the tolerance. Quick. Uh, the uh, taste of a mitra is a uh, one thing that even to this day I I just cannot get over how bad it tastes, man. I always say the bitter the better. <laughs> yeah, I always am have a, a chaser with it. Like I've had people that are like, "Dude, how can you drink that? It tastes so nasty." And then. The best way that I can explain it to people, it is like you don't drink vodka for the taste. You're drinking it for the experience. Same thing with a uh, meter. You're not drinking it because it tastes good. You're drinking it for the actual effects of it. Yeah, after five years, I can tolerate it a little bit better. But, you know, some of it, it's all right. I, that just reminds me of a real strong coffee or something. I've, been sitting for a while. I've noticed that the uh, red veins taste the least disgusting, though. Correct. Right. Yep, they, they, they're never that bitter. The, usually the greens or the whites have that bite to them, or yellows, they have that bite to them. Could you explain to everybody what what exactly the gold of a vein is, the yellow vein, and then, like, all of these other veins? Like, what are they? Because you have the three main veins, but then you have these other unique ones. Well, the yellow is really, like, a white that's dried a little different. It has a little dry, uh, drying process. But the different ones, there's still arguments out there that there's really no such thing as different veins. There's no vein colors. That it's just one type, that's it, and it's just dried differently. And that the different brand names, whether you call them Borneos, Bally's, Mangas, are all recipes that the Indonesians have, and they mix them together and have these recipe books. Well, I've never heard of a recipe book. My guy who I talk to doesn't have a recipe book. I don't carry any of the crazy names. I carry like Agatha and Mahakam and Ryu. And those are different regions of Indonesia where those where these trees grow. It's like I live in New Jersey. New Jersey tomatoes, Jersey corn. Well, you got corn and tomatoes in other parts of the country too. And sometimes they taste a little different. They are a little different. Well, no different than any other plant. So that's where I really like to focus on instead of the name. So we got away from that, but. My opinion is the drying process really matters um, what happens in the way for production. Um, I've looked at most trees that I can see close up pictures from Indonesia and the trees that I had and other people I know. And I can see some with the red and some with the white, personally. I don't see any of them with a green bank. So, and I can even pull up one right here that I had on how good you can see it. But God, dude, those are so pretty though, man. The veins are actually white. There's no, it looks the same back and forth. So I don't know if you can see that. But there's no real, you know, to that. So I really think it's more of a drying process that does that creates these colors. So how much is, okay, so first, how much are seeds? Um, I don't know about the seeds. I had, I had uh, purchased three plants. Uh, a couple of years back, and I put them in a little tent and bought all the equipment for the tent and had them going in there. And because Jersey gets pretty cold in the winter, and had them going good enough until I brought them out in the summer and they stayed out all summer. And now I can bring them in the house. Um, I actually so that could, one behind you, how much was that? Um, I think they were like 40 bucks. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think they were uh, 30 or 40 bucks. I'm not really sure if I remember, but they weren't that, they weren't that expensive. And they send you pr pretty good sized trees. And, you know, I, I think it was my trees of life. I think that was the name of the guy. And I never had a problem with him. What is the process of getting nature from point A to point B? From the time that it grows, how do you turn it into powder? 
Um, what they do is it's almost like the process of drying tobacco. Uh, it's supposed to be covered, um, not direct sunlight, because direct sunlight can hurt the alkaloid. So they always like it to be in a covered area. Um, definitely elevated. Um, there's a lot of growers and a lot of people that still use old methods where they would just lay out the trim leaves on the tarp on the ground and let whatever, the river water or rainwater just wash it over. And there's a lot of just insects and stuff crawling on it. Like, it's just not sanitary. They're trying to clean that up out there too. So that's going to be getting cleaned up probably in the next year or so. So the growers groups out there are getting organized to where they're not doing, they're doing everything the proper way because they want them to stay legal too. They want it to be around and they want everybody to be, uh, be able to get it. So plus the economic availability out there, that's also why the Mitra is the biggest moneymaker out there for them economically. And they know, they know if they ever made that illegal over there, it would really hurt them. Yeah. And you, you see, I mean, even looking at it from an objective point of view, making this plant illegal is potentially very, very dangerous because there are a lot of people who literally need it so they don't go back to alcohol or methamphetamine or crack or whatever. This That's plant correct. saves lives. It gets people off of stuff that is very, very toxic, and to make this illegal is very, very dangerous. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want cannabis legal everywhere, but I personally think that it is more important to have Mitra illegal over cannabis. Oh, well, they're saying there's probably about 15 million users in the United States. There could be more than that. And if you think about it, if you have 15 million users of, you know, Mitra in the United States, well, how many percentages of them are using it for, you know, getting off of drugs? Well, we don't know. We don't know the exact, but let's, let's say it's 10%. But there's so, enough people. Yeah. So even if it was 10%, that's one and a half million people. Well, you take it away, you ban it, you do all that. Well, that's one and a half million people that are now going to go back to whatever they were doing. And probably half of them are going to have a bad day of whatever in the hospital or OD because they haven't done another substance in a while. I know people that have took their quote unquote heroin break for a while trying to stay clean. And they went back to it, back to what they were normally doing. OD, they died. And that's it. Because you, you think you can handle what you, what you used to be able to handle. And it's sad. And that's one of the biggest problems, trying to make sure that, you know, it is available. It isn't banned. It's, it's not looked at like it's something evil. That's the thing that really bothers me. When I hear things in the media, when they're talking about how bad it is and people are ODing, I'm like, are you guys kidding me? Like, nobody's ever died from cannabis. Just like nobody's ever died from cannabis. Just like, you know, I mean, yes, the only time that anybody has ever died from me was because it was mixed with some other substance. It sure. The, the plant itself, you cannot die as a direct cause from it all by itself. No, you can't. I mean, I had, I had a, where I probably should have been on painkillers at the time, about a year and a half ago, I had broken fibroids, and I couldn't even breathe. I was so much pain. And that's when I first started looking into an extract. I was like, all right, I got to find something to help the pain. And it worked. You know, my tolerance was through the friggin' roof. I was probably using two ounces a day, plus the kind of extracts to try to stay out of pain. But I would not take painkillers. I was in so much pain, but I was taking them. So it was, <laughs> it was, it was a rough uh, six weeks. But Speaking I'll tell you, of which, how is the up. extract made? That I'm not really too sure of. There's so many different ways, and there's proprietary methods that people won't even let loose about the way they're making it. But I mean, from what I understand, the best way to do it, like a home way to do it, if somebody wanted to, it would be alcohol extract. Um, uh, I, I've heard of so many different ways of people doing it. I've heard of um, people doing it on their stove, taking the powder with whatever water or alcohol or whatever, cooking it on the stove. Like, there's so many different ways to use the extract, but it's not a big field that I ever looked into. It just wasn't something, I mean, I know there's a call for it, but I don't really, I don't know. It was just something I never looked into. I might in the future. Well, back to the topic of the whole uh, heroin thing. I mean, heroin is never, ever, 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 ever safe to consume. But the fact of the matter is, it is now more dangerous than ever, especially with people putting fentanyl. Oh, yeah. It's mostly uh, my, around here. Around here, I live in the, uh, basically the Philadelphia metro area. And that has been the biggest killer out here is the fentanyl for years now. Yeah, uh, my my uh, ex girlfriend's uh, uh, brother uh, died from that. They found his body in the uh, bathtub. That that shit is not funny at all, dude. Like, 
people aren't understanding just how bad that stuff is getting. Oh, it's very bad. We had a neighbor about a year ago, my neighbor next door, and same thing. He stopped to use heroin use for a while and went back to it and ended up doing whatever he did. I think they found seven bags on him and I think three or four bags at one time. He didn't need any fentanyl. So it's just horrible. Mm. I wasn't the first person to be doing reviews for Mitra, but I was the first person to actually take it as seriously as I was taking it. In fact, my YouTube channel got terminated for six months because I had over uh, 50 uh, reviews on my channel. And I put so much time into those. I would make short films um, in, um, inside of them. I would have reviews going into them. Um, and like, I put so much into it and all of it got deleted um i had uh, a lot of it saved my google drive so i'm putting all of that on my facebook page but oh. it is still the idea and um and i kind of uh, take pride in knowing that i was one of the original people to actually be taking it seriously i was the first person to be doing it on that level and having the connections that i did with all of the biggest uh websites from cracking dot com to the to the connection dot com to zenlifenaturals dot com to all of them and uh, I would like to see more people on the internet taking it just as seriously to actually get the word out and showing people that this isn't the fucking hell drug that a lot of people think it is. I agree one hundred percent. I have people that I know that like I have customers that come from all walks of life. That's all I'm saying. I have some that are actually judges, lawyers, cops, and every one of them in the professional field has said to me and said emails and made phone calls and talked to me and talked to you know customer, my, my wife or my daughter and customer service, and they were like, why do you have every video I see that looks like a junk? Why? Why can't anybody talk serious about this? Why, are you, why does it help me? But I'm looking at anybody who would Google it or go on YouTube, it looks like it's horrible. It's like you, you need a PR just for the YouTube videos. And I had no answer for them. I don't make them. I don't know. You because know, there I, are a lot of people who like to abuse the substance, just like there are a lot of people who like to abuse cannabis. Yeah. And just like and you were not, saying earlier. Yeah. And not in a good way. Like, if you're using it to be productive, to be creative, or you're using it for medicinal purposes, that is one thing. But if you're just doing it so you can feel good and be high... I, I do not agree with that. I think that that is the main problem. Yeah, definitely. And just like I talked to people with the, about the cannabis, I said, cannabis isn't just for getting you, getting you high all day. I said, it's a medicinal plant. It's supposed to be used as a medicinal plant. It's supposed to be used as a medicinal plant. And you're right. Everybody, people can abuse anything. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It does not matter. It does not matter. Yeah, there are even people who, uh, um, who abuse uh, LSD. And... Um, it is one of the psychedelics that can easily be abused because it is a psychedelic, which granted you can use it for shamanic purposes, spiritual purposes, and all of that. But if you're a speed hit who likes hallucinations, you can certainly abuse it, whereas you cannot abuse something like ayahuasca or DMT. If you try to do that, it's going to give you a reality check real quick. And the main problem right. whenever it comes to LSD is the fact that these days, it is so hard to come across pure lysergic acid alchemy 25 because it is usually replaced with research chemicals and all of these other sketchy substances yeah. that actually have the potential in, to actually end somebody's life. And that's what I was just having a talk with that over the summer about with somebody I know. They were somebody who, like you said, loved to abuse men. Love to abuse speed, love to abuse that type of, you know, love that high. Well, decided that it'd be a great idea to, like you said, do we know if it was pure? We don't know what it was, but take 500 hits of acid. So, no. Uh-uh, no, like, even if it was pure, I wouldn't do that. That is, that um, is crazy. I you that they were probably in another world, universe, wherever they were, for a good three weeks, I'd say, two to three weeks. Not good either. Not good. This person has other mental health problems that didn't add up. Whenever it comes to me, okay. in your own words, 
why should it remain legal? Um, how should people use it? And what do you think the dangers of making it illegal are? It should be used. And if people use it recreationally, that are in contact with themselves, then that's great. But being abused, is, um, people making extracts, I've heard people making extracts shots a day. After a while, it's not going to work for you. Take a break and reset yourself. So that's what I believe. And that's why I think sometimes crime gets a bad name, just like anything else. Anything can be abused. You see sugar being abused. Um, there's just anything you can go on forever about it. But I think freedom is a lifesaver. I think that it is one thing out there that I've seen personally in my life saves so many people. Um, and we've been in business 10 years, so you're talking, I'm probably talking 10,000. And every one of them has said how much they love and all believe 100% that crime should remain legal and be available to everyone. So, I don't know if I skipped over any questions there. But... The uh, dangers of uh, making it illegal? Um, of, yeah. I, I think the honest danger of making it illegal is what I was saying before. If you had maybe 10% of the world using for to stay away from the harder substances well then you're going to have 1.5 million people that are going to have either OD or their lives are going to be in turmoil again and just take you and i for example in your situation it has saved you from a life of chronic pain for me it has literally saved my life so yep. it has helped us both in maybe in two different ways but it has still helped us in ways that that nothing else could. Oh, and yeah. that is only two of us. Oh, yeah. And I know so many people have stopped alcohol. With you. And I've said that it completely took the urge away. Completely took the urge to drink. Now, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I still enjoy drinking. And I will drink on occasion. But I no longer have, have like, I, I no longer feel that need for it. I don't wake up every single morning with a bottle in my hand, chugging down a quarter of it just to get my day started. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I make a cup of tea in the morning. That's what I do to get my day started. I usually uh, wake up. Uh, I make some uh, coffee. I eat a, a meal, and then I and then about one to three hours after that, then I make some mitra, and then I and then that is whenever my day really starts, and. Uh, Usually by then I'm already editing something or I'm watching a live stream. But then by that point, I just start working my ass off. I start doing my podcasts. I start doing my live streams or I'm working on videos. And I have a whole plethora of uh, different uh, videos. Because the thing about uh, DMT Infinity is the fact that just like pure concentrated in and dimethyltryptamine, DMT Infinity is everything. I do everything from podcasts to gaming videos to tutorials to drug education videos to short films, to music, you name it. Oh, that's cool, man. I'm actually working on a music video at the moment, not for a song of mine. It's more of like a, a fan-made music video, but I'm using it as a way to promote my upcoming uh, album that'll be dropped January 1st. Awesome. Well, I'm subscribed to your channel, so. DMT Infinity. Um, so whenever it comes to music, though, what would you say your top three favorite bands are? Um... I used to when I well, I grew up as a pretty much a teenager in the '90s, so my things were I was really listening to like Rage Against the Machine and a lot of stuff like that growing up. So you know that was kind of drilled into me growing up with that type of music. But I got older. I mean, I still listen to some of that, but I don't know. I mean, I, I listen to all types of music. To be honest with you, um, I really like every really like everything. I get into my days where I'll listen to classical music. I'll listen to jazz. Have you ever heard of Tool? Whatever. Oh, Tool, definitely. I was just going to mention Tool. That was the second one. It's Have cool. you heard their most recent album? No, I heard I heard that they went completely opposite from where they were. The Here's the problem with their newest album. It took them like 10 or 15 years to release it, first of all. And I... Look, I'm a huge Tool fan. I love all of their albums. The lead singer, Maynard James Keenan, he is my lyrical idol through and through 
but I personally think their new album would have been a million times better if he was not on it. I think that he completely destroyed it because on the rest of the band's part, it sounded like a, a Tool album, and it was certainly worth the wait. But on Maynard's part, it just sounded like throwaway lines from his band Pussifer or something. It didn't like it wasn't what it wasn't what Tool has been. I mean, don't get me wrong; all of their albums have evolved. I mean, bands change and they evolve, but this sounded like they like he de-evolved. Personally, I think that their best album was either um, um, Anima or Ten Thousand Days. Ten Thousand Days was a fantastic album. Yeah, I don't remember which one was which back then, but um, I do remember listening to them all the time. And Ten Thousand was- Days was the one where uh, where some of the songs was uh, dedicated yeah. to his mother. Okay, I do remember that. Vaguely, uh, '90s were a little bit, a uh, little bit rough too. So, you know, I was uh, born in a 1997. Uh, so, I, I feel like I grew up in the wrong generation because I would have loved to have been at least like 12 or 18 in the '90s, dude. It was, uh, it was a little crazy. I mean, I just remember going. I just remember being a teenager and like, I, we never got into the. LSD a lot, but what we had gotten into, we knew somebody, and we got into the mescaline a lot, and we had a whole, a whole long time of that. So. Do you know a philosopher named Terence McKenna? I've heard of him. Yes. The man is a genius, and I don't mean this in some spiritual or religious sense, but I genuinely believe that he was some sort of prophet. I really do. Yeah, I gotta, I, I gotta start reading more things about him, and I, I've just been getting back. I just read the other day. I haven't read it in probably twenty years. Uh, Nessa Dorada, and I forget who it. I think the, the author's unknown, but it's called the uh, Nessa Dorada. It's, it's if you want to get into a Terrence, look up his lectures on a uh, on a YouTube. He has he has like thousands of hours worth of uh, of uh, lectures. Okay. Yeah, I like to listen to a lot of that stuff sometimes when I'm in the truck or driving or whatever else, and I can just put it on so and listen to them. Do you watch anime by any chance? Uh, no. No, the, the little bit I do know about it is from some uh, people in my family, and also uh, my buddy from Indonesia is very big into it. So that's one of his favorites. So. Uh, recently, I think it was like six weeks, I mean, uh, six days ago or something. Do you know what hentai is? No. Hentai is, it is anime porn, basically, right? But okay. it, but, uh, but about a week ago, it was made illegal in Australia. Okay. And they were, and they were claiming that what it was, was because they claim that it promotes, um, incest. It promotes pedophilia, and it uh, promotes um. Well, those were the uh, two main reasons. But I personally have a problem with that because the fact of the matter is, is okay. Let's say that that they have ones like that because they do. But that is not the majority of it. Isn't it technically cartoons though? Yep, Japanese I, animation. I want to make sure I'm on, I'm on the same page. Okay. But the main problem is the fact that personally. I think that whether people are into it or not, you shouldn't make something like this illegal just because you have this small little disgusting group of 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 these fucking creepy ass motherfuckers because that does not represent the entire group of people who are actually into it. And now in Australia, it is illegal. Well, it's just like you were saying with the community. Yeah. Some people who are cannabis or any other community, you have some people who are just whatever, you know, give it a bad name, and then you have everybody else who's trying to do the right thing. I am 100% understood. Don't get me wrong. I don't I don't think that there shouldn't be laws in the world. I don't. But I think that, 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 peop, that all societies really need to take a good look at their laws and actually ask the question, does this law make sense? Is yeah, it fair correct. to everybody? Correct. Is the law just? It's like in the state of New Jersey, we have a um, cannabis activist, and he swears he will not, nobody will ever put him away. He's like, the laws are ridiculous. Why are you telling me I can't do this? I can't grow weed. I can't do what I want. And he'll go to court. He'll do it. He said, you're never going to find 12 people that think this is the law that's right. 
and he's gone won a couple cases like that because he couldn't have to agree that the law was even just so it's they have to change laws or they have to have people wake up and realize these laws are unjust and either help change them or stop convicting people i mean it is one thing for murder or senseless murder to be illegal but it is a whole nother thing to sit there and say that somebody cannot consume a plant that cannot kill somebody and actually has the potential to get people off of hard drugs like methamphetamine and crack and heroin. And like even whenever it comes to something like murder, yes, murder should be legal. I think that anybody who isn't terminally sociopathic or psychopathic can agree that that is a very just law. But I think that there are exceptions in the sense like it is like it is one thing if some dude goes up to a random old lady and then blows her brains out just to steal some money. But it is a whole nother thing if you have a have a mother with a pistol with a little child and somebody's trying to kill the child and then she blows that person's brains out. I think that that is justified because she is protecting her child. But yet in most situations that mo that mother would most likely be arrested and that's not fair no that's the same law as uh, in new jersey there's no you know castle law or anything like that if somebody comes on your property i mean and you shoot them whatever it is you're going to jail you're going to be arrested I mean, you even if you them. have like no trespassing signs sometimes that's even an issue with the, i don't know the exact laws but they say those didn't even hold up in court really jesus so, christ it's just some states are just really strict. Jersey's one of those strict states. Their gun laws are real strict. Their gun laws are very strict. Um, you you can get a carry permit, but you have to go through a lot. So what is the future of Christopher's Organic Botanicals.com? Where do you see the website in, say, three years? Um, well, we're still working on building a new website right now, actually. Probably be launched by next week. Um, at the latest so that's going to be all um, basically we were using a home built server website Volusion. it was um, basically they do all the hosting and take care of a lot of the stuff at the back end the front end I mean we work with it too but it's more all in one so to speak um, we're just going into something where we're tearing everything apart and we're re re uh, rebuilding all the parts and we're going to really have it set up right I really hope to see a future where me is legal everywhere and is actually understood, studied correctly by the right professionals and people who can benefit from it uh, will actually start to use it and less people will abuse it. Yes, I, that, that's my hope for it as well. Uh, I really truly hope five years from now more people know about it. If y'all want to purchase some high quality meat, uh, meat so then y'all can go over to christophersbotanicals.com. There will be a link down in the description. But as always, I'm your host, DMT Infinity, and I will catch you all in the next. Peace.